Hi, I'm Walker Bragman, and uh, this is Katie Hi, Halper. Hi, I'm Katie Halper, and we're here at Pace Studio uh, interviewing Matt Taibbi Hi. for Pace Politics. And as probably everyone knows, Matt Taibbi is a Rolling Stone journalist and the author of four New York Times bestsellers. Yeah. And he's here to talk about media, and also uh, you have a new book I do. called The Fairway, which is available on Substack. Yeah, the- I'm writing it serious, serially uh, on a site called Substack, so it's at taibi.substack.com. Okay, and it's really good. Everyone should read it. It's called The Fairway. Mm-hmm. And you frame this as a kind of update of Manufacturing Consent, which is the groundbreaking book by Noam Chomsky and Ed Herman from 1988. Mm-hmm. So for people who haven't read your book or maybe Chomsky's, uh, Chomsky and Herman's book, can you explain what the propaganda model put forward in manufacture, manufacturing consent is and also why you had the need to update it? Sure. A lot um, of questions. Yeah, no, there. it's a lot of Sorry. questions. So uh, I grew up in the media. Um, my father was a television reporter. All my early experiences were around the media. My childhood was, was like the movie Anchor Man a lot. Um, and so I thought I knew everything about the press. And then when this book came out in 1988, um, Manufacturing Consent, I read it as a, as a teenager. And um, it really was mind blowing to me at that age. It, I think it, and it, it, a lot of reporters had similar experiences reading this book because it was very eye opening about how the American press works. The basic theory of manufacturing consent is that most Americans <clears throat> don't think that there's propaganda in our system because they turn on the television or the radio and they see this vigorous debate going on and they and they see freedom and they don't see hear any stories about people being suppressed. So they feel like it's absolute freedom of speech. The reality is because of a variety of processes that almost entirely happen off camera, the um, the sphere of debate is sort of, is sort of artificially narrowed before you get to see it. And what Chomsky and Herman talked about was this idea that when you open up an op-ed page, you will see a Republican and you will see a Democrat, and uh, that will represent the limit of acceptable public opinion. And you won't really see anything else besides that. And that editorial decision to sort of exclude other points of view, that's where the propaganda is. And it, it, this idea of keeping everything within a range um, is extremely important. And there's a whole subset of stuff that Americans don't get to think about, like whether or not we commit atrocities abroad, uh, you know, particularly with foreign policy right. that they focused on a lot. Uh, and you know, that, that was a big influence on me as a young reporter, you know, trying to do things that exceeded that a range of allowable opinions. So um, that book had a big influence on me, and I, and I thought in the internet age that it was worth looking back and seeing what was still the same and what what needed to be addressed in terms of what was new about the model. So it's interesting. You you talk about um, a little bit in the introduction about the foxification kind of, of, of right. news. And what effect do you think that has had on... Uh, how or or I shouldn't say what effect, but like how do you think that has impacted this propaganda model? Well, I think it's it's had a huge effect. Chomsky and Herman, who were both academics, you know, Noam Chomsky from who was at MIT at the time. He's a linguistics yeah, professor. So um, Ed Herman, you know, he worked. He was at the Wharton School, an economist by trade. So neither of these people are journalists. Uh, when they published this book, it was right before a couple of really big things happened in our business. And one of them was this innovation that you specifically saw on sort of afternoon radio here in New York City, uh, and then later on with Fox TV, which was this idea that we're gonna consciously sell you political slant um, as a product, right? So No longer feigning objectivity. No longer feigning objectivity, which incidentally was also a commercial idea, right? Like, I think a lot of people think that this is some ethical thing. Right. uh, (laughs) But actually, you know, the reason that most newspapers have that boring third person voice is because that's what sold most once. Um, But Fox came along in the 90s and they, you know, Rupert Murdoch and Roger Ailes, they had this great insight, which was if we feed people news that we know that a certain segment of the audience is going to like um they're going to they're going to be loyal they're going to stay in tune to us we may lose 
other people, but we're going to capture that demographic. And that, that dynamic was huge uh, in starting this process of, of breaking the news landscape into little silos mm-hmm. and demographics that everybody would capture. Does that make sense? Right. Yeah. It's, it's, and you know, it's interesting to me that, that this book would have had such an impact on you because you got your start in, in journalism really, uh, in, in Russia in the nineties. And, and, you know, you and I have talked pretty extensively about this, but the, the difference between the reporting that was making its way to the States versus what was actually going on at the time, uh, was pretty galling. Oh yeah, no. I mean, all the things that Chomsky and Herman write, wrote, wrote about in manufacturing consent, they're very much amplified when it comes to foreign reporting. Um, because typically, what happens when you work in a in a foreign country, if you're a foreign correspondent, uh, almost everybody ha- uh, reports the news through the lens of whatever America's foreign policy right. happens to be at the time. And so, when I was in Russia in the '90s. Um, and this was during the Yeltsin years to begin with. You know, later I was there for Putin. But the original sort of plot line was Russia is becoming a democracy and a capitalist country, and that's good. Um, we're their friends, and uh, and we're going to look for signs of positive change. And so you had these armies of reporters who were all out doing the same story, which was, hey, there's an emerging middle class. You know, like we're, we'll let's go to a town like Samara, and we'll find. You know, some guy who has a VCR, he never had a VCR before. Like, there were a thousand <laughs> of these stories. And so, you know, I I was living there, and my primary purpose was not to be a reporter. I mean, I was living there, I was growing up, and I, I had started studying there as a very, very young person. And I was seeing something completely different. You know, people had lost their jobs, they lost <laughs> their health care, they lost their free education, they were not getting paid for almost a year at a time. And uh, it was very, very stark to me, this dichotomy, like there's this enormous amount of suffering on the one hand. And then if you look in the American reporting, it's like, oh, it's all this good news. And VCRs. Yeah, exactly. It was really weird, you know, and it, and it, Moscow on the, on the make. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And so that, that was part of the, part of the reason that I even started thinking about stuff like this. And you got Chomsky's very secular blessing uh, for this project. Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't want him to be cross about right. it, you know? So I, I reached out to him and I told him, you know, it's not like I'm going to do manufacturing consent too, but right. I want to kind of do like a, a rethink of, of your book. So um, uh, I went out there and I interviewed him and I talked to him about, you know, what had changed, what he saw, what, you know, and, and so on. And, you know, he was great about it and he's, you know, very generous. And he had a lot of really interesting things to say about the modern media landscape, I thought. Um, the, and uh, and that was that was really interesting. So what are some of the things that you um, saw, that he saw, maybe one of you saw, the other one didn't, uh, about the modern media landscape? Things that weren't predicted by um, manufacturing consent or things that the, their model didn't apply to? So I think the big place where I don't necessarily see eye to eye with Noam Chomsky um, is about the the sort of dominance of Facebook and Google and what that means for the media. Um, you know, most Americans aren't aware of the fact that these companies, you know, Facebook, Google, Twitter, they're not just social media companies or search engines. They're also very, very important in another wing of the business they never even think of, which is media distribution, right? Like in the old days, your newspaper had its own distribution system. They had their own trucks. They had paper kids, they all, you know, all that stuff. Now, almost everybody gets distributed through two companies, Facebook and Google. It's like above 75% of the country. And so they wield this enormous power over the press. And Chomsky's view on this is that it doesn't matter because the the people who are making the content are still the New York Times and the Washington mm. Post and, and so on. Um, whereas, you know, I think it's important because these, these uh, distributors have algorithms that severely skew what news you see and when and why and highly individualizes your media experience. You know, particularly Facebook, it drives content to you sort of like Fox does. It drives content to you that it knows that you're going right. to agree with, right? Well, it doesn't matter what the politics are, 
but that's what it does. And so, um, but in other ways, it's held, you know, his model is exactly the same as it always was. I mean, you know, manufacturing consent completely predicted like the Iraq war episode, for instance, right? Like when, when we need to, we still organize together. Well, it's, that's, that's interesting that he doesn't think that, uh, the, the like aggregators kind of matter because it, it also has the, the effect kind of, of forcing traditional media companies to compete with the kind of off brand, independent, mm -hmm. more partisan, uh, more outrageous uh, outlets. And so, I mean, does that not enter the equation? I think so. I mean, I, I think it's had an enormous impact on what do you have to do to keep your audience interested, right? Um, in the old days, you know, when, when they first wrote this book, there were three networks, there were a few big newspapers, a couple of big newspaper chains, and that was it, right? Um, and you didn't have to compete with, you know, some guy writing out of, you know, his or her basement, you know, or, you know, there was I.F. Stone, right? But there, there weren't that many independents, right? right? Uh, now, if you are, um, you know, if ABC News... Uh, you have to compete with people who are coming up with the craziest clickbait headlines all, all day long, right? And it's not just every day or two, two, two broadcasts a day. You have to do it minute by minute. Right. And so I've, I've seen this on the campaign trail. Like when I first started covering campaigns, reporters filed once a day. Now they're probably making some kind of content 100 times a day, whether it's a tweet, you know, an Instagram photo, something like that. And that, that, massively enhances this competitive thing and it's it's really really I, I think it's really really bad for the business generally how so well for a couple of reasons it 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 uh it places much greater emphasis on news stories that are visual um uh, visually sensational that are breaking um you know, the 24-hour news cycle really drove us towards stuff like the Kursk disaster, right? Or a baby thrown down the well right. or something like that. Baby Jessica? It, yeah, exactly. Like, if you have to fill I all remember. this time, you know, you need a story that's that's ongoing, right. right? And you need something you can just sort of comment on. You know, you don't want to have to actually do any reporting. Malaysia so, Air. <laughs> what? Malaysia Air. Right, yeah, right. exactly. Yeah, that's perfect. So, uh you know, I, I think what's happened is that this emphasis on now, 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 it, it has this impact of devaluing reporting, yeah. research, investigation, and increasing, you know, things like just arguing. Right. right. Because arguing is just another form of content that you can sell, but you don't have to actually do when you're digging, you know. One of the things that... Um I I really found during 2016 was that I knew about media uh, bias and how subtly there was kind of a distortion, um, but it really was a wake up call for me. I mean, being a, an, a kind of unapologetic Bernie bro, mm -hmm. Bernie bro feminist, um, <laughs> I was amazed. You know, we saw the New York Times change its headlines. Oh yeah. Then we saw. I stealth mean, stealth editing. Yeah, stealth editing, and it stood by that. I mean, that wasn't. We could do an entire show on that, but yeah, this embrace, shows, yeah. Probably, yeah, but this embrace of of changing the headline so it was less flattering of Sanders of changing the actual content. I mean, it wasn't just that they got caught the New York Times changing it, but they defended it. The top editors. Um, I think that for a lot of people, 2016 kind of took the mask of objectivity off of the media. Sure. So you say in your book that you are kind of unspooling, I believe is the verb that you use, unspooling the secrets of the media in the context or leading up to 2020. Yeah. So what is the potential effect of that? Um, like what, what can people, what should be, what should people be looking out for? But also is, is that your own form of propaganda in a, in a good sense? Sure, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm selling something right. just like everybody else, right? So I, I'm not exempt from this. Yeah, Th this thank is, God. This is part of my own, you know, I, I had this very weird, unique situation on the campaign trail, which was that almost everybody else who's out on the campaign has to file constantly. I worked for a magazine that filed very rarely, and even in that context, I was only maybe filing once every couple of months. So after every event, Everybody else is banging away, right. you know, they're all doing something. And I would be sitting there just like twiddling my thumbs. 
And I, I constantly got in trouble for making too much noise by reading, or I did a Rubik's Cube once, I got, I got in trouble. <laughs> um, so for years and years and years, I had nothing to do except sit and just think about what the hell are we doing here? Right. Like what, what, what is this, right? And so that experience kind of led me to think a lot about, well, what is the campaign trail? How does it, like, what, what does the reporting do and, and what kind of behaviors are we actually engaged in? And most of what it was in the pre-Trump pre, uh, era was basically the journalists are judges in a beauty contest, right? And we, we run people through a series of tests and if they pass all of them, we sort of give them our blessing to be the nominee. So, the, so uh, you know, the candidate has to look presidential, has to be, you know, tough on crime, you know, strong on defense, nuanced, right? right. And we use a million code words to tell you whether candidates are good or bad, right? So pointed is bad, nuanced is good, you know, fringe is bad, right. like presumptive front runner is good, right. you know? So we, 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 we do all this signaling to tell you who you should vote for, basically, you know, and it's very nefarious when you think about it, because we're really just telling people, you know, this is a bad candidate, this is not a real candidate, so and so. And I think a lot of what 2016 was about was people rebelling against that, you know, and you saw it very graphically on the Trump side, but also on the on the Democratic side, you know, somebody like Sanders, I, I watched this with Kucinich, you know, they they constantly just ignore people like that. And in the internet age, they couldn't do right. it, you know? And that's when you saw the things like the, the, the Times coverage just suddenly became negative as opposed to just right. ignoring. The 16 articles from the Washington Post. Right? With negative in, headlines in about yeah. Sanders, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you 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 must have noticed it all, all, all of that, yeah. right? It, it, it was kind of a moment of clarity. Yeah. Uh, and and it, it, it kind of went all the way up to, to the convention. I mean, inside even the convention hall, the, the, the treatment of the Sanders delegates, the media outright ignoring their like protests on on because there was a there were protests on every single day. Right. There was a walkout which did get coverage, right. but then but the, in a way this, that just made people look crazy, but like crazy pathetic Sanders, uh, you know, diehard fans who who had a savior complex or something. Right. I mean, I, actually, I wrote a piece of, for you when you were editing my piece at Faced about this. About that was that was a lot of fun. Yeah. The mean, Edi- editing the mean, and then reporting. Yeah. And 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 having to take it all in. Well, they mo- I mean, the media <laughs> mocked Sanders supporters so openly mm-hmm. um, and t- showed them crying. I mean, it was. And they and they completely ignored like like the 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 third day they had like a mini convention where Nina Turner spoke and uh, that was actually the first time I I, I saw Nina Turner speak and it was, it was very impressive yeah um, but they just they don't touch it and and they they have to kind of focus on it now but even still there's this there's this negativity so how do you how do you kind of get around that because. They're they're sort of it seems to me that they're kind of wrapping the negativity up with the soap opera news that people can tune in and eat up right. every day. Yeah. Well, there's a couple of things going on. First of all, I think people have to understand that this is not like something where everybody huddles up in, in a back room and says, well, we're going to try to elect right. Hillary or, you know, it's totally unconscious. Right. This has to do with your entire experience in the media, right? Like all of these things are sort of built into the way you view politics in general. And and so reporters over the course of long careers, they just get ideas about who is and is not an acceptable politician. And some of these things have to do with things that shouldn't matter, like how much money is the person raised, right? I remember this was an issue with Howard Dean. Like I was on the plane when Dean was introducing himself to the press and um, and Dean was getting all of his contributions from small donors at that time. And the, the talk among the media was, well, he can he can never win if he doesn't get the big money. Right. And I'm like, well, ac- couldn't you spin that the other <laughs> yeah, way? Like exactly. this, is, this right. is a positive, right? right. Um, but so we bring all these sort of preconceptions to the way we cover things, and it's very cultural, um, and it's it's also exacerbated by the fact that uh, it's a bubble, right? right? So thing. you know, we we're almost everybody who's in the press in contrast to the way it was in like my father's day back in the sixties and seventies, um, when reporters, you know, for ages came from, 
you know, more working class roots, right? Mm -hmm. Like you could, it was a job more like being a plumber than Mm -hmm. a profession, right? Um, Now almost everybody's upper class. They've been to, you know, uh, Ivy League schools. And you don't, you know, covering that story, you don't really mix with other people. And and your whole idea about what's going on out there comes from pollsters and from political aides. And so it's just sort of flying circus of, you know, reinforced opinion. And, right. and I think that's why you had so many crazy surprises in 2016, because we're not really taking the pulse of what right. people are really thinking about, right? I mean... No, that it, it was pretty... It was pretty stunning the, the right. disconnect, which, is, which and it persists to this day. Right. Like they haven't they haven't stepped back and said, "Oh boy, we, we better fix that we got, problem." We got it right. wrong. Right. Right. Yeah, <laughs> there seems to be this um, really frustrating confusion between kind of realism and ideology. Mm-hmm. So something you see with politicians and with the media, it's even more disappointing with the media, is this idea that they're just reporting the facts, like with the Dean thing, right? No, they're not. It's not an ideological thing. You just can't win with small donations, right? right. Or it's not an ideological thing. You just can't demand Medicare for all. Right. And people don't realize how much their own ideology goes into that. Yeah. Um, is there a way to, like, change that? Is that just something that's inevitable? And, and how do we, moving forward, how can we... Um, I guess this is maybe this is a, an ambitious question, but how can the media, independent media, independent journalists like you, how can you help wake people up and maybe even defeat Trump and Trumpism? Not to give you well, too much of a I th- work assignment. I think it's probably easier. To pr- it's probably going to be easier to educate the public about how the media works than to change the media. Because right. just to take an example, the the campaign trail story, it's independent media can't cover it not really because the it costs too much right. like just to give you an example my last trip covering trump the three-day bill was like just under thirteen thousand dollars to to fly around and cover the candidates so you imagine what it costs to follow week after week after week and i my company used to do that but that's only a very few outlets are able to actually cover that story, which is one reason why you get the same kinds of people right. in the plane, right? Um, so it's much easier to try to spread the word to audiences about, well, here's what this means when you read this in, right. a, in a campaign story. If you if you see somebody uh, described as unrealistic, right? right? Or if you see somebody described as... Um, quixotic. Quixotic, right? That's a great one. Quixotic means like this person cannot and should not win, right? And should not be taken seriously. Right. And, and that's across the spectrum, like Ron Paul, right? right? Kucinich, you know, it doesn't matter who... Um, so I think people need to become aware of all these tricks, and um, that's one of the re- one of the things I'm trying to do. You know, I, I I spent years and years and years cataloging all these things, and I'm finally going to try to sort of put them all into paper, basically. Yeah, it's 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 a uh, it's a worthy goal. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but do you? I mean. Do you see a, a, a kind of a, a, a waking up, like a mass waking up to this, this outside of, I mean, obviously 2016 was, was kind of jarring for a, a lot of people, but outside of that, do you see uh, any, any traction? Like, have we gotten to the people who weren't already? Right. Well, people already hate us. They hate right, the media. For various right? reasons, yeah. And, and that, I don't We're know nice whether people. that's a positive or a negative step but it's a step and Trump took, right. took huge advantage of this, right? Like, so we, we usually, we typically had life and death power over candidates, right? Like once they slipped up, we just sort of piled on it. I've written about this be- before. It's a thing called, I call the seal of death, mm. right? Like once somebody does like the Dean scream, right. it's, it's three days of negative reports. The person drops 20 points in the polls a week later, they're out of the race. Like that's, we had that power, right? We tried a dozen times to mm. do that to Trump in the, just in the first couple of months. And not only was he resistant right. to that, he came out and he basically said, they're doing this to me yeah. and you shouldn't let them do it, right? And his voters responded and he, he went up in the polls. Right. So I don't know what that means. Is that good? Is that bad? Um, I think I would hope that people are more more aware of it all, all around because – um, you know, the, the same kinds of things that went on with Trump were, were more subtle on the other side with, right. with Sanders. But, you know, Trump got 23 times the amount of TV coverage right. that Sanders got. 
Um, and uh, and that won't happen this time because Sanders, if he runs, he's going to have a lot more coverage. But the, I, I would imagine it's going to be much more negative over, right. uh, from the start. So. And how do we defeat Trump uh, and Trumpism? I mean, I feel like there still hasn't been this wake up to I mean, you hear people talking about Russia all the time. Mm-hmm. And regardless of what you think is happening, what you think happened, that doesn't resonate with most Americans and it certainly doesn't. not with the people who aren't already leaving the house to vote. Well, of course not. So people can't afford to like buy groceries right. or health care. Right. A, a, somebody messaged me on Twitter and was like, I have cancer and I, I can't get treatment. I have to, you know, pay my rent right. and, and it's spreading and. Yeah, like, they'll have to do a GoFundMe. It's or life or death for, right. for, for for people. Right. So how how can we wake people up? What are the issues and what's the framing that can um, galvanize people? I mean, uh, you're absolutely right. And it, you know, it, even if you stipulate that all the Russia stuff is true, right? Um, <clears throat> it, it's for for most people out there, they're they're in such a dark, pessimistic place. Right. They're so steeped in this in this kind of like crazy fatalism, like. They just do not care what what happens, and, they, and that was part of the rationale for electing Trump. Right. Like, yeah, let's just blow it yeah, all exactly. up, whatever, right? The status quo like, is That's how mad I am, right? And so I think you gotta somehow you have to make an argument directly to those people, and a very very strong, simple argument about how we're gonna change mm-hmm. things, right? And um, that, I think that's what they haven't done. Right. Um, they've spent a lot of time on politics. Uh, stuff that matters inside the Beltway, right. uh, but they haven't they haven't made that sustained case to the people. So that that would that would be, you know, I, I think what not to harp on Sanders too much, and and I don't agree with him about everything, but you know what he's doing right now with like Amazon and right. Disney and all that stuff. That's the kind of thing that right. you know will resonate like a little bit. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like people people want to see that somebody's sticking up for them, them. Right. right. As opposed yes. to like, you know, what do, what do I care about Russia? Yeah. I live in like Duluth or whatever it right. is. Right. So, and, and I think it taps into this kind of it can tap into and also shift and turn around the xenophobia. Right. If you're like Trump isn't protecting American workers, then I think I mean, I'm a big Bernie fan, as you can tell. But I feel like from there you can become you can have a kind of larger moral perspective where it's more about I mean, we're all internationalists behind closed doors, but for now we can't like reprogram people. So I think just saying kind of like, no, he's not protecting American workers. He's not keeping the jobs here. He's, he's taking them abroad. Um, I think to me, that seems like the stuff that resonates with people who sure. are suffering as opposed to the Putin did X, Y, Z stuff. But, but if I could just add just, yeah. just, just yeah. quickly about that. It's okay for an American politician to, to prioritize the problems of Americans right. over other people. Right, I mean, yeah. Sanders said this explicitly, like, I, you know, I'm elected by the people of Vermont. My first responsibility is to the people of Vermont. Yeah. That's that's not xenophobic. Right. That's just, you know, reality. Sure, right. And I think that's a, that's a message that for some reason has become taboo. And I, I don't, you know, I, I understand in, in, in the Trump age why right. that's a dangerous subject matter but you know there's a way to communicate that's that right and i think he does i mean i guess that's what i was saying is that i think he is an internationalist so i'm not at all concerned is what i mean with right. the way that he'll be spinning this but, but. Do, do we as as journalists have uh, a responsibility to, to kind of forego the the stuff that that sells for the stuff that matters like it seems to me that we we don't we don't have stories about homelessness today because it's a problem that we've all that doesn't make headlines. Right. We're used to it. We're we see it. We're desensitized to it. Uh, that even now, healthcare, GoFundMe, healthcare is something we we see all the time. So you don't get you don't get headlines about it. Should we be focusing more on those issues, the the stuff that people see every day, even though they're not sexy? Well, the problem is how do we get paid? Right. Right. So. Um I mean, and this is this is not something that's easy to talk about, but traditionally in this country, we've always had some kind of subsidy for journalism, uh, particularly investigative journalism, you know, dating back forever, you know, like to the time when newspapers got free postage, you know, like there mm-hmm. were newspapers that went west on the Pony Express uh-huh. went free. Right. So 
you know, that was free distribution, right? They didn't have to go through Facebook to do it. Um, the original bargain of the Communications Act in the 30s was you do your dumb stuff like sports and sitcoms and you make your money there and right. then you have to plow some money into the news, which is going to, which might be a loss leader. And that was the bargain, right? We've given up on that model. So now everything has to make money. And if we have to make money, we're not going to make money talking about homelessness or, you know, the criminal justice system because why? It depresses people. They're not going to buy Buicks if they're seeing that on, on screen, right? So this is what people have We're found out over the, the years. Right. Hmm? We're not going to show the bodies. We're not going to show the bodies. We're not going to show the bodies. War coverage has to be of, of a certain type, right? Nothing if, about Yemen. Yeah, nothing about Yemen. You can't have babies. You know, the stuff that you tweet about yeah. all the time, you know, the, the, you know that that is not going to sell Pampers, right? It just isn't, you know? Right. So, um and so there's a there's a there's a problem there. We have to figure out how to how we're going to fund this going forward. Uh, well, speaking of which, we should um, mention again your uh, where people can see your book both mm -hmm. for free and also they can pay some extra and get some bonus content. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's a taibi at Substack com, and Substack has has other writers as well, um, and you will get access to it's a subscription basically, right. you, and this is a model that I hope works for other reporters. Uh, you get to see this book. You get to see another book I, I wrote previously, co-wrote with a drug dealer called The Business Secrets of Drug Dealing. Um, so anything that I end up doing, um, you know, you'll, you'll get you'll get access to yeah. that. And it's really a, I hear with a certain large donation, you get cell phone access at any time of night. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Texting, at least. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's really great. And as usual, it's really well written and in really exciting with really exciting language, and I think you do a great job. One of the things you do such a great job with is you make potentially boring things exciting and accessible at the same time, which is pretty hard. Um, so thank you so much. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Walker. Where can we find you online? Oh, uh, well, if you're watching this, you probably know, but you can find me on Twitter, uh, or you can read my stuff and paste. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, but but yeah. Do, do we have a minute? Because I want to oh. I want to ask about your your experience with the Yemen thing because this, yeah. I, this I find fascinating. It'd be right? funny if the, if we got cut now. Speaking of censorship, it goes off air. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so this is a classic example, and this is something Chomsky even talked about. This story. It's a classic example of like we'll cover Syria, we right. won't cover Yemen. Right? Worthy because victims. It's worthy and unworthy victims. The, one is a client state of America. One isn't. Right. So. Um, you've been basically on this like sort of one person crusade to to ask to get people to cover this thing and and what's the experience like doing that because it fe it feels like I, I, it feels like you're actually making a little bit of headway uh, which is which I actually didn't forgive me I didn't expect that no uh, I, I people say that and I I I'm like hesitant to take any credit for what's happening I mean you have fantastic journalists in Yemen right now who are gaining traction. They're, they're putting the stories out. I, I mean, I'm just facilitating, you know, spreading that to, to my audience, but it hasn't been, it hasn't been great. Uh, -huh. uh right. you know, it's, it's it, Chris Hayes did like a two minute right. segment on Yemen and then he did a podcast, but, it, uh, and actually I have to say CNN has done hmm. a fairly good job. They've, they've showed, as much as you can expect them to show the graphic footage, uh, my goal was to is to kind of get them to to show the the full Monty. Yeah, yeah whatever whatever is out there, the the worst of the worst. Because, I mean, if we if we are going to mobilize people around an issue that doesn't affect them personally, it's something that they can they could go through their entire lives without right. thinking about what's happening in Yemen. Right. Um, Although we fund it, that's one yeah, way that's to, thing. to like, make you know, it look your tax right. make it relevant, are right? Incinerate y y yeah. Yemeni children, like you know that. Yeah. Uh, is bothersome. Like you know, some of those videos um, are impossible to watch, and like you know, go yeah. on with your day afterwards, right? And I, I didn't sleep for like a, oh really? Like yeah. A good, a good month. I, I my anxiety was just because I've I've been on this kick since I, like the first of August. I've made a point to to mm. at least mention it every day. Right. Um, but it's a very high anxiety story and it's, but like, I'm not living it. And right. like yeah. the people who are there course, are putting the it out could, every day. Yeah. They're living it. They're seeing it. And if they can do that, the least we can do right. is pay attention. Sure. Yeah. Sure. But that to me, it just underscores how crazy it is that we don't, we don't really 
do this sort of thing. Like, you know, you think about what happened in Vietnam. Yeah. Even you know, forget about showing what happened to, you know, the people we were actually bombing. Just the trauma of seeing American soldiers being killed was enough to freak out the American public. But now we've stopped even doing that. Right. So war for most people is this like bloodless um, thing. They see it in graphics like oh, the lines right. until, it a come, bit. until it comes home. Yeah. Until, until, it, comes, until it comes home. But even then we don't cover the body. Like, right. We don't see the bodies coming home. The body for coming instance. Home, yeah. Right? But you get it in the local in your yeah. like, local. And you experience. Like yeah. A, right. A it kid just, I went it's to just, high school right. is now, you know, all that's really remains of him are the memories of, with his family and, and a bridge that's named after him. Oh. So but I mean, do you, I mean, I, I, yeah. I, I submitted to being embedded. I submitted to all those rules. I felt guilty about mm. it later, right? I, you know, I, I just wonder if we had covered any of those conflicts the same way that we should cover wars, like would, would any of this stuff mm. still be going on? Because right. I think Americans would not tolerate, do, you know, the, the images of their kids coming home with the horrific injuries right. that they get with modern weapons. You know, it's like unbelievable. Um, and I think the, the Yemen thing is a is a... It's a classic example of something. If somebody, if everybody could see it, like minds would change pretty quickly, wouldn't they? I mean, uh, that's that's been my going philosophy. But but uh, I have to say, posting those photos, uh, there, I was getting reported by people who disagree with my politics because right. I would post those photos, and because we have, you know, these these uh, overlord social well, media whole, companies. Yeah. yeah, they, I, I, my account got. Like l limited, right? Temporarily, which uh, is good job, ridiculous. people. Good <laughs> job, you're helping cover up the slaughter of, of children and other civilians. On the one hand, I don't think people really want to see it, but on the other, I I firmly believe that journalists have a responsibility to these stories and and to really talk about the things that matter. And I'm sorry, but that doesn't include Russia Gate right now like yeah. it's not that is that is so low on the priority yeah. list until Mueller's investigation is done and there is something concrete right yeah how about and for every minute of Russia gate you you have like 10 minutes of or just one minute yeah, on Yemen would, even the other other yeah. ratio would be fine sure with me, you know yeah I just mean, something but you know but again it's something that it just sort of drilled into you like this is a story that's not a right. story and it's not yeah, it's not like the Soviet Union where they come in and they say no, you can't do right. this. It's just like this, that's how your brain, yeah. you know, is is trained over the years. And I, and um, I just, I just wish people understood the degree to which that unconscious sorting process is just instilled in the whole business and and um, and, and how nefarious it is. Yeah, and the yeah. groupthink, which makes you feel yeah, like it's not exactly. happening because yeah. everyone else is doing it right it, it almost sounds like i mean when we say it's unconscious that that almost like lets the narrative makers off the hook for, that's true. for not realizing that they're creating a narrative right. and i mean you have uh, that that could be true to an extent but like i also i i think that there's some el there has to be some element of of conscious decision making like yeah, where personal at the, at the, politics at come, the executive come into play. level, sure. At the executive level, yeah. Right. But, but what you see happen at the, you know, at the sort of journalist level, is that they they consistently promote, kind of like B minus C plus minds, you know, to those positions. On a good day. You know, and and, and these are they're, they're promoted precisely because they don't think about stuff like that. I mean, if you if you listen to somebody like Chris Hedges talk, right? Great reporter, probably a very difficult person, yeah. I would imagine, to work with, right? But that kind of person does not advance in an organization like the New York Times because precisely because they're asking questions that, you know, that are that, you know, what are we doing? How does our business model work? How can we cover this and not that? That's not what they're right. looking for. They're looking for somebody who like just comes with a copy and, you know, their brains are between mm -hmm. here and there. And, you know, we even talk about the Judith Miller Right, the Judith yeah. Miller for the world. We unfortunately, because this has been so great, have to wrap up. Sure. Um, but thank you again so much. Uh, thank you, Matt Taibbi. Thank you, Walker Bragman. Thank you, Katie Halper. Yeah, thank you, and uh, thanks for watching. This thank is you. Paste Politics uh, coming at you live from the Paste Studio in Manhattan. So see you next time.